Our next topic is about how the world is shifting to the extremes. If you read the news, you see that happening, and we heard quite a bit about it just now when Ambassador Ross was speaking. Well, we're joined for a very interesting conversation today by Ambassador Dennis Ross, by Avi Sakharov, and the conversation will be moderated by Raphael Aaron, the diplomatic correspondent from Times of Israel. Now, Avi Sakharov is the Middle East analyst for Walla and the Times of Israel and host of an IDF show about issues in the Middle East. Avi is also the mastermind behind the Ophir award-winning drama series, Fauda. That's right, it's a great show. <laughs> Previously, Avi was the Arab affairs columnist for Haaretz newspaper and the Middle East affairs correspondent for Israeli public radio. He has also co-published two award-winning books on Israeli security. Raphael Aaron obtained a master's degree in modern Jewish history from Yeshiva University and a master's degree in journalism from Columbia University. He also worked as a reporter and editor for several American Jewish newspapers. In 2008, he moved to Israel where he has reported for Haaretz from Jerusalem. And since 2012, he has been the diplomatic correspondent for the Times of Israel. Please welcome them to the stage. Good evening. So the topic um, of this session is uh, about the extremes. And when I was thinking about the extremes that we faced in 2016, um, I was actually thinking about um, that it's a tough year for democracy, at least a challenging year for democracy, certainly for uh, basic democracy. Uh, when you have in Great Britain um, a majority of people voting to leave the European Union, against the better judgment of the prime minister they had just voted and uh, basically every financial expert in the world, you have to ask yourself uh, questions about basic democracy. The same uh, is true, I think, uh, and this I'm saying regardless of, of where you stand politically, but when thousands of American primary voters vote for a candidate in the presidential, uh, for the presidential elections against the express will of the party's leadership, that again raises that question, and of course you see, um, especially in Europe, uh, far-right parties, extremist parties, if you will, gaining power. Just today we had the um, far-right AFD party in Germany again uh, make significant gains, uh, so much so as to threaten the reign of uh, Chancellor Merkel. But we're not here to um, necessarily discuss the merits of democracy. This is a bit uh, large for us, but uh, certainly uh, questions like Brexit and the gain of the far right is, is one thing I would like to discuss. Um, and I think I'd like to start with the elephant in the room uh, that Ambassador Ross, you very uh, eloquently uh, managed to avoid, um, <laughs> Donald Trump. Um, he's one um, phenomenon in this slide uh, to extremes, if you want, or to, to populism, however you want to define it. Um, and I want to pose the question to the both of you, whether uh, you think this is really uh, a global trend that we're going to see increase over the coming years, wh or whether this is going to plateau at some point. Um, and then, of course, I'll have to ask you, uh, Ambassador Ross, uh, whether you think that pres a President Trump would be uh, a good thing for Israel. So, you want me to deal with that second? Uh, yes. I'll, f I'll first, you know, we can first, you know. Right. So, um, look, I think there, there is a, an international phenomenon. Uh, it's a, in part, it's a reaction to globalization where uh, you have um, movement of peoples, you have a different educational level sort of emphasized. Uh, you have a lot of uh, you have a lot of people feeling threatened. You have the middle class feeling under siege uh, and uh, worried about what the next generation 
uh, is going to look like and whether their kids are going to be worse off. I mean, Brexit was driven as much by the fear of these new immigrants as, as anything else. So it's, it's, a, it's taking a segment, meaning the middle class, that was feeling more secure, having them feel threatened by different kinds of social forces, uh, and longing for a past where things seem to be more comfortable and more secure, uh, unsettled by whether the jobs they have now are jobs that will continue to exist, unsettled by the demographic changes, uh, generally a kind of feeling that the norms that they were used to are no longer going to define their existence. So, you know, it, it creates a lot of different challenges. Uh, it means we have to think about how we sustain people uh, who feel threatened economically. It means, you know, for those whose jobs may be uh, phased out because there are new ways of doing those jobs, it means a lot of retraining. It's easier to retrain younger people, harder to retrain older people. What is ironic is that some of the big companies like AT&T and Walmart are now providing incentives for their own employees to constantly learn new skills. They're, helping, they're, they're paying them to do it. Uh, so it shows they kind of get there's a, you know, there's a new dynamic economically and that if you're going to keep pace, you have to constantly be able to adjust to what are new kinds of capabilities, new techniques and the like. Somehow we need public-private partnerships that facilitate that kind of retraining. You need a better social safety net for those who will find it more difficult to make the adjustments. We need to take account of how disruptive the kind of changes we've seen uh, have been if, in fact, we're going to cope with what is a kind of basic challenge uh, to the middle class. Uh, and, you know, the, in a sense, the the loss of faith in governing elites and the loss of faith in experts who are seen, seen to be serving those governing elites. You avoided my second question, and then I'll no, ask I, you a question. I'll, I'll answer it when you get to the second question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a skilled diplomat. Um, Avi, we had uh, the Arab Spring now uh, sort of has turned into an Islamic winter, as many people say, um, and I wonder whether there is sort of, um, whether we can expect some kind of aftershock that is following the American and the European model of sort of a frustration. Is there something that you can um, sense in the Arab world in terms of fr growing frustration and of sort of a slight to more extremism? If uh, Trump will win, or... <laughs> um, no, I, I think that what we see on the ground is probably what we're going to see more all over. Whether you want to call it frustration or poverty or unemployment and more terrorism, where you, you, wherever you look in the Middle East, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Libya, we're probably going to see more of that. Uh, my bottom line is that we don't see a kind of a hope over there. Even this last... Um, uh, ceasefire in Syria it lasted for what? A few days and then the bombing continued and then the killing continued. And I think that there's not much hope over there where we have so many different players that are trying to undermine the regime, that undermine the other side and at the end of the day, I don't see the end. I don't see Syria as a state. I don't see Iraq as a state. You know, maybe some miracles will happen in the Middle East. Maybe Iraq at some point will be a state, but Syria no more. Forget about it. It's not a state. It's a name. It's a kind of a reminder of what we had in Syria. And um, I'm sorry to say that, but this is the Middle East, and it's probably going to remain like that in the next couple of years. And yet we see, and Ambassador Ross mentioned that before, we see a convergence of interest between Israel and the Arab states. And it's clearly um, undeniable that something is happening right there. And what I always wonder, and I would like to hear um, both of your opinions on that, is whether there really uh, is uh, more to it than what we have right now. Right now we have um, very covert co cooperation, and yet the Arab states have not publicly changed 
uh, their voice towards Israel. You have here and there a retired general meeting with a former Israeli official, and that's about it. And I wonder what Israel is getting out of it, and whether Israel can maybe push a bit more to uh, get perhaps some kind of public knot, which is uh, important in diplomatic circles. Okay, so that's the third question, so I should answer the second question. Please so. do. I thought you were just... Um, I'll answer the second question, and I'll answer that. All right. Look, um, I think that the way you ought to judge both candidates is not necessarily on what they say about Israel, but you ought to judge them, what's their view of the world? How are they approaching the world? Uh, do they approach, for example, the Middle East in a way that will ensure there won't be vacuums? I mean, if, you, if you're Israel, what you want is an America that has a strong position in the Middle East because that makes you stronger. You know, I just took a trip to Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Israel. One of the things that was common in all three places is that all wanted the U.S. relationship, all saw the U.S. relationship as being a pillar of their well-being, all wanted the U.S. to be uh, more prominent in the region, not seen as withdrawing from the region, not leaving vacuums. So uh, if I were to look at the two candidates, I'd ask the question, who is more likely to stay engaged in the region, understanding the dynamics of that region? Who is going to have a relationship uh, with allies that can be dependable? Uh, and who's not. So how you answer that question should tell you a lot about who you think makes who in the end will be serving Israel better. You know, I was saying at the end it's in America's interest to have a strong Israel, but it's also in Israel's interest to have a strong America. Uh, and an America that is seen as retrenching and withdrawing internationally is not a strong America. Uh, as for your third question, which was on how real uh, is the convergence between the Israelis and the Arabs, and should Israel push more to get things more visible? Um, Israel shouldn't be demanding greater visibility because it doesn't gain anything from it unless it's rooted in something. One of the reasons a lot of the Arab states won't be more visible is partly because of the Palestinian issue, I should say largely because of the Palestinian issue, because that's an issue that still has a kind of resonance in the region. Even if it doesn't drive behavior, it's seen as an issue that relates to injustice. And there's been a socialization of Arab publics over the last two generations, three generations, of hostility towards Israel. So you can't turn that around unless you're also dealing with the Palestinian issue in some fashion. But it doesn't change the fact that private cooperation is important. What Israel does with these states is important, contributes to their stability, and it, their stability is in Israel's interest. I said the United States doesn't need failed or failing states in the region. Israel needs failed or failing states uh, far, you know, even less. You know, Israel needs states that have addresses. Israel needs states that can contribute to stability. When you have failing states, it creates an operational space for groups like ISIS or Al Qaeda to emerge. So what matters to Israel is how to help preserve a kind of broader stability. That matters more than whether or not they have visible relationships. Do you agree with that, Avi? Do you think that th this is all that Israel can expect from the Arabs in the absence of a peace agreement? I'll start with the second question, if you don't mind. <laughs> and I'll be a bit shorter. Trump is not good for the state of Israel. And this is my point of view. And I'm sorry for being not politically correct. About the region, I do agree. I think that Ambassador Ross uh, describes it very accurately, meaning at the end of the day, we don't need Abdel Fattah Hassisi, the president of Egypt, coming and visit Jerusalem. It's a lot of traffic jams. <laughs> we don't need that. We need the security coordination to continue. We need Egypt to do whatever it can and it does to stop the smuggling of weaponry into Gaza Strip. We need it to, to coordinate with us all kinds of secret actions that are happening just underneath our nose in Sinai with the Israeli army and the Egyptian army operating together against ISIS targets. We need the Jordanians on the same side. But then again, even if the Jordanians will say, oh, Israel is the, Israel is the occupier, Israel is doing this and that, all the time that the security coordination continues, it's fine with me, of course, and even with the state of Israel. And then again, it's a lot of traffic jam. 
for the, the people of Israel, it's a kind of a big headache if someone will come and visit. And even with the Palestinians, you know, although uh, the hostility between the two leaders is there, it's out there in the open, you know, every day that passes by, the Palestinian security is preventing terrorist attacks against Israel. Every day or every week that passes by, the Palestinian security is saving Israelis that are entering the A territories, the Palestinian Authority territories, by mistake. And every day that passes by, we have more economic coordination. And just last week, just last week, we had an agreement that was signed about building a new gas pipe to Gaza. We had the post agreement. We had a kind of an understanding about 3G technology to the West Bank. We had the electricity understanding agreement about the dots that uh, the Palestinian Authority has to the State of Israel or to the electricity company of the State of Israel. So at the end of the day, you know, although we don't hear very big declarations, all the time that the security and economic coordination continues with the states in the region, it's good news for us. But you know better than most of us that this might just uh, fall to pieces tomorrow. Like that. But this is the Middle East. No one can promise you anything. I mean, you know, people are asking me, what do you think will happen in the region in five years? And I'm like, I don't know what will happen in five days, so how can I see? Right. But, but let me come back to Ambassador Ross, because as a senior diplomat, um, recognition is a key goal of diplomacy, if I'm not mistaken. And, and what Israel is doing, it is, uh, or Prime Minister Netanyahu speaks often about a position of strength, that in the Middle East, you need to show that you have strength, um, that you're not weak. And what uh, could be interpreted as weakness is Israel saying, well, we work together with uh, the Arab states and we provide them with intelligence and we coordinate and publicly, though we get slapped in the face. Isn't that projecting a position of weakness rather than one of strength? Well, I don't think it's protecting a position of weakness. I think it's what it reflects is Israel has a capacity to see what's actually in its interests. Its policies are driven by what's in its interests. It's in its interest that it should coordinate the way it does with these states. That coordination potentially can lead into something more. That's what I was saying. There, this is a potential asset that right now the U.S. is largely excluded from. A new administration might be able to take advantage of this. And as I said, it may be something that has relevance not only vis-a-vis -vis the Iranians, but could also have relevance vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian issue as well. It should be probed. It should be tested. We should also be patient. We shouldn't. You know, one of our problems is, uh, I think, particularly this administration, when it came to the Israeli-Palestinian issue, had a tendency to create a binary choice where either we would solve it or we'd do nothing. You know, we're not able to solve it right now. But if we do nothing, that's another way to create a vacuum, and it just gets worse. The disbelief between Israeli and Palestinian publics has never been worse than it is today. So one of the things you have to do is, are there ways to address the sources of disbelief? Are there ways to restore a sense of possibility? You know, the support for two states is declining dramatically on both sides, but that's because neither side believes it's going to happen. So one of the things to do is to recreate a sense of possibility. Now, I mean, let's talk a little bit about um, the security situation right now. We had um, sort of a mini intifada starting about a year ago, uh, and then it sort of ebbed down, and in the last few days we've seen an increase again in attacks. Do you think now again, um, leading towards the high holidays, we're going to see a repeat of what happened last year, that we have a long month of bloodshed? Not really. I mean, we hoped in a way that it ended. My feeling, I, I must say, when I was there in the field, while well, I'm trying to figure out what's happening on the Palestinian side. My feeling was that it almost ended, it almost over, but it was, it was pretty obvious for me that all the reasons that were there for the last escalation of October 2015 was still there now, a week ago, two weeks ago, and the reason that it didn't happen, the reason that we saw less terrorist attacks is, uh, well, kind of uh, understanding of the Palestinian Authority that it's not good for its interests, yes, but part of it was successes of the Israeli intelligence and the Palestinian intelligence. Every day that passes by, that passed, the Israeli intelligence and the Palestinian one went and arrest people that wrote all kinds of things on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. I'm going to become a Shahid, I'm going to kill Jews, I'm going to do this and that. And the way that they managed to, to create 
the tool to find them managed to decrease the number of people that wanted or were on the way to do attacks. Having said that, it doesn't mean that it's 100%. And at the end, when you have one guy, Jordanian citizen, that succeeded in stabbing, or not even succeeded, but tried to do a son as kind of a, an attack, it's epidemic. Then comes another guy from Hebron. Then another guy from his family from Hebron. Then an, a third and a fourth. And suddenly you have, then again, the same wave of going up and down and up and down. And I'm sorry to say that. I don't see it ends completely with no political horizon. What role, if any, do the PA elections have in this whole cycle of violence? Could they be a signal for it to stop or even to pick up on violence? If they will ever take place? <sighs> Not really, no. That, you mean the local elections? Yeah. Uh, well, the, the, they were cancelled. Now there's a word that it might happen again. I don't see really the way that it affects things uh, on the terrorist level, on attacks. Uh, you know, this is completely internal politics between Fatah and Hamas. And, you know, Fatah might, at the end of the day, win some, gain some achievements in the West Bank, but Hamas will also. And if it would happen in Gaza, that might have been the big surprise, Gaza. Because we think of Gaza as Hamas, Hamastan, ta 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 ta, -ta. Fatah might have won elections in some of the cities in Gaza if there were. One more question regarding the Palestinian issue. Ambassador Ross, how serious do you think are Israeli concerns that uh, President Obama, uh, before inauguration day on January 20th, is going to take some kind of initiative to advance the peace process? Well, I think he would like to do something. I think he'd like to leave some kind of legacy. He's not he's not going to invest a major new political initiative where he has to, or diplomatic initiative where he has to go do something, but he, you know, he could, he could give a speech between, after the election and before inauguration day. I think there are concerns in Israel that he would um, present a, a Security Council resolution on parameters. I, I don't know that he will do that It is possible he could give a speech and say the French or someone else could introduce a parameters resolution based on the speech. And then the question becomes, if they water that down, which I think is highly likely, I mean, part of the problem is any speech the president would give would be balanced in the sense that he would address Palestinian needs as it relates to the border in Jerusalem, and he would try to address Israeli needs as it relates to security and refugees. And... My guess is, in a Security Council, the Israeli side of that would get watered down because the Palestinians would be so against it. Uh, and then the question becomes, if somebody else has introduced this as a resolution, and it waters down the essence of what the President has, has offered, which would have been balanced between the two, does the U.S. then veto it? And I think that probably is going to be heavily influenced by the outcome of the election. I suspect if Trump wins, the President would be more inclined to go for a Security Council resolution to try to do something that binds, creates uh, standards for the future that this president, the next president, couldn't undo. If Clinton wins, I suspect he would be more sensitive to her concerns as to whether or not this helps or hurts her. Just to follow up, in a Trump presidency, he would initiate a Security Council resolution or he would just not veto one that somebody else brought well, up? Well, first, I can't say. I don't know. But if you ask, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing he'll be much more inclined to try to be proactive in terms of presenting something that could create standards for the future that the next president couldn't undo. I have also another issue. I understand that we're running out of time, but I have um, at least one more question I want to put to the both of you. Ambassador Ross, you brought it up, the threat of BDS, and you were very clear and adamant about it. Um, and yet I want to ask you um, about the argument that I sometimes hear that the more we talk about BDS and the more we portray it as a strategic threat, the more we give it the oxygen it needs to survive because otherwise it's a marginal phenomenon that would just disappear if we just stop talking about it. There are more and more legislations across the states um, basically uh, nullifying attempts at BDS and uh, it had no economic impact so far. Um, so why do we keep on talking about it as if this is really um, this really 
serious threat? Well, first of all, it has much more weight in Europe, so it does have a kind of life of its own there. And here it has a weight on a number of campuses, uh, and their tactics are, are changing in that they're trying to identify with other minorities who are oppressed and trying to make themselves kind of a comparable minority. I would just say, you know, look, on the campuses where it, it has a kind of weight, you know, you're looking at what the potential impact of this can be 10, 15, 20 years from now. Uh, and the fact that it is, it really is about delegitimization. Uh, you know, I think it has to be taken on. I don't think, you know, the idea that, well, gee, if we just don't talk about it, it won't exist. Uh, you know, it started some time ago and it has more weight today than it had when it began. So I think uh, we shouldn't kid ourselves that this is something that we shouldn't have to deal with. Avi, what about, what about BDS in the Arab world? It reminds me you know, of uh, one of my visits in Ramallah. I went to a refugee camp called El Amari, which is really at the center of Ramallah. And I went to a kind of a pool club over there where very young people gather around to not to go to school and to play pool. So I found a few of these uh, young students or ex-students that ran away from school and were playing over there. And then I started to talk to them. At some point, they looked at my cameraman, and they didn't understand, like, was he Israeli or not? So they asked me, tell me, is he a Jew? They thought I was a local guy, so they, I told them, yes, he's a Jew. And you are, where are you from? I said, Tel Aviv. And like, ah. Oh. And then I was sure that it might create some kind of tension, you know, the Jews came to Al Amari, to the pool club or whatever. And then one of them with the shirt of uh, his dead, his dead uh, brother. His brother was killed uh, during clashes with the Israeli army. So he had this picture of his on his shirt. And he asked me, are you from Israel? I said, yes. Can you find me a job over there? <laughs> and what I'm trying to say here is, that the BDS movement, it's a kind of a nice game for students in Europe, maybe students here also, California. If you would ask the, the average Palestinian about the BDS, it's like take off the D from the BDS and you've got the, the movement. <laughs> This is like the average life of the Palestinians. Can you think about boycotting Israel? Can you imagine that? For what? You have around 120,000 Palestinians working in Israel. Most of them are legal, by the way. Boycott Israel? What, are, what about Gaza with Hamas? Boycott Israel? Even Hamas is not calling for the boycott of Israel. What? Cutting off Kerem Shalom checkpoint with the 1,000 trucks that are passing every day to Gaza? It's like crazy. And I want to see one of these BDS guys coming to Ramallah, to Manara Square, And telling everyone, stop going to work in Israel. is going to be stoned in seconds. So this is what I think about the BDS. Yeah, but A, you're right. By the way, you're right. But those the people who are here are completely divorced from the conflict. The irony is they want to perpetuate the conflict. That's what they're about. It's not about ending it. Right. Do we have time for one more question? No, we don't. Do we have questions from the audience? Yes, we do. They should be appearing. They should be appearing on my screen. Sorry. Ah, the time is over. So I thank very much my panelists, Ambassador Dennis Ross and Avi Saharov. Thank you very much.